Hello everyone and welcome to today's kitchen session, the Norman Conquest, King Harold and Chester. My name's Claire and I'm one of the higher education advisors here at the University of Chester and today I'm joined by Dr Thomas Pickles, one of our senior lecturers who will be delivering the session. I'm also joined by my colleague Anna who's assisting behind the scenes today. I just want to start by reassuring you that your video and audio are not shared at all during the course of this session. And just to give you a little bit of information about how today will work. So during the presentation, you will be able to ask questions in the chat function on the right hand side of the screen. You can ask questions anonymously if you wish. You just need to tick the box to say that you wish to be anonymous. You can also like questions that other people may ask so that we can prioritise those in the Q&A at the end. So that's everything from me. So it's over to you, Tom. Welcome everybody, welcome to the kitchen sessions and I'm a lecturer in medieval history here at the University of Chester and today I want to talk to you about a really fascinating story that connects the Norman conquest of 1066 and King Harold with Chester. Now I only encountered this story when I arrived in Chester back in 2013 to deliver my Norman conquest special subject. And I read a seminal paper by Dr. Alan Thacker, who's here, and he was responsible for a lot of work on Chester as director of the Victoria County History. And he wrote this paper in a volume you can see here, The Middle Ages in the Northwest. So I'm going to be following in his venerable footsteps today, and you can go off and read about this if you want to afterwards. I want to ask the question first, what happened to King Harold in AD 1066? But then I want to follow it up with the question, what was supposed to have happened to King Harold after AD 1066? What was this story? And then I want to follow that up with the problem of where that story came from and why people chose to tell that story. So let's begin. What happened to Harold in AD 1066? Well, you probably think that you know the answer to this question. Edward the Confessor, King of the English, died childless in 1066. His brother-in-law, Harold, who was also the most powerful Earl in his kingdom, succeeded to the throne and was crowned. But he faced several rivals for his throne. He defeated one of those rivals at Stamford Bridge near York, Harold Hardrada, King of Norway. But in turn, he was defeated by another of those rivals, William, Duke of Normandy, in battle at Hastings in Sussex. He died and was buried. The reason you think that this is what happened is it's what all of the sources nearest in time to the events tell us happened. So the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, a series of year by year entries re retelling what happened to Norman authors, who wrote official histories of the conquest, William of Jumierge and William of Poitiers are in the centre here. And indeed Guy Bishop of Amiens, who wrote a poem commemorating the conquest in the late 11th century, all tell us that Harold died in the battle. The Bayer tapestry, which you can see top right, reiterates this. You can see here the death of Harold, Harold Rex Interfectus Est, Harold the King is killed. William of Poitiers tells us that Harold's mutilated body was found and it was recognised by a distinctive mark and he was taken and buried on a headland overlooking the sea near Hastings. However, during Edward the Confessor's reign, he'd given to Harold a church at Waltham, now Waltham Abbey in Essex, and Harold had rebuilt that church. The monks of Waltham tell us that his body was then translated to Waltham Abbey. And this is also what the famous historian of the 12th century, William of Malmesbury, tells us. So it seems fairly simple, doesn't it? This is what happens to Harold in AD 1066. What then was supposed to have happened to Harold after AD 1066? Well, by the reign of King Henry II, who reigned from 1154, to 1189, the people of Chester knew differently about Harold's fate. Two texts that were written during his reign, the Waltham Abbey Chronicle 
and Gerald of Wales's journey through Wales, reports that Chester had a tradition that Harold had in fact survived the Battle of Hastings and had come to live as a hermit at Chester. By far the fullest account of this though is given in a life of Harold, also written at Waltham Abbey and probably between 1201 and 1206 at the beginning of the 13th century. And it survives for us in this lovely manuscript you can see in the center and you can go and read about it in the British Library. That life of Harold draws on two Chester witnesses who tell us what happens to Harold. The first of these is Seabert, who is supposed to be a former servant of the king who'd lived in Chester and then retired to Stanton Harcourt in Oxfordshire. The second of them is a hermit who claims that he had succeeded Harold in the hermitage at Chester and shared a servant with him. So the first of these, Seabert, tells us that Harold had survived, had gone to live in Winchester in secret, then travelled to Saxony in what's now modern Germany in order to get help to reacquire his throne, but changed his mind and become a penitent pilgrim. He then returned to England and spent some 10 years in a cave at Dover before he travelled up into Wales and then with angelic guidance, no less, came to the church of St John's at Chester. The Hermus claimed to have succeeded Harold. Added to this that Harold had spent some seven years at Cheswardine in Shropshire before he then came to St John's for seven. He gives us the details that Harold had received the last rites in the chapel of St James in the cemetery of St John's from Andrew who is a priest of St John's and that he'd confessed his real identity to that priest, to Andrew. Well, evidently this story of Harold's survival and his life at Chester circulated quite widely. It was known, for example, to the historian Ralph Abbot of Cogshall, who was writing in the early 13th century. It was known to an English cleric, a priest at Laon in northern France, also in the early 13th century. And it was known to the author of a 13th century Icelandic saga about King Edward, the confessor. Evidently, too, the people of Chester continued to promote this idea. A 14th century Welsh chronicle, you can see here, the Chronicle of the Princes of Wales, tells us that in 1332, the people of Chester discovered Harold's uncorrupted body in the Church of St John, still clad in leather hose with golden spurs and wearing a crown. The famous Chester historian Ranulf Higdon in the 14th century referred to this in his Polychronicon, which you can also see here, and he described it as a matter of, in Latin, farmer publica, public report, public gossip, public fame in the city. So this is what the people of Chester thought had happened to Harold. Where did this story come from then? What are we to make of this? Well, as usual, as historians, we start with the problem of whether this story was true. Immediately, we confront a problem. What do we mean by true? If we mean, did Harold survive the Battle of Hastings and come to live as a hermit at Chester, then the answer is almost certainly no, he didn't. So all of those sources closest in time agree that he died on the battlefield, that he was recognised, that he was buried and then perhaps translated to Waltham Abbey. Quite apart from that, we can guess that Harold was probably born in the early 1020s. So imagine he survived to the reign of Henry II to live in Chester. He would be the ripe old age of 130 or 170 years old, which seems slightly unlikely even to me. If on the other hand, we mean, was there someone knocking around in 12th century Chester who claimed to be Harold? Then the answer may well be yes. First, various of the details related by that witness, Sibert, and that other witness, the hermit, are verifiable. In the reign of Henry II, the Church of St John's at Chester did indeed include a priest called Andrew, who acted as a witness on some documents, a chapel dedicated to St James, and some hermits. 
as we can see from these witnesses. Second, at the same time, there was a separate tradition that another important royal male had retired to Chester. So this wasn't the only person claiming to be a dead king in Chester. Gerald of Wales in that same work, The Journey Around Wales, tells us that no less than the German Emperor Henry V, who ruled from 1106 to 1125, had chosen to abdicate, to give up his throne, and moved to live as a penitent hermit in Chester. Ranulf Higdon again repeats this story. Third, there are some close parallels for impostors claiming to be long dead kings and nobles at this time. According to the historian Walter Mapp, in a text known as the Courtier's Trifles, Henry V's abdication prompted a number of different pretenders to masquerade as the former emperor, including one who was unmasked at Cluny in central France. The Waltham Abbey life of Harold that we've seen that tells us about Harold living as a hermit also claimed that his brother Gerth, who was supposed to have died at Hastings too, had survived the battle and that Abbot Walter of Waltham had met him at Henry II's residence at Woodstock in Oxfordshire. So this story may well come from the fact that someone was living as a hermit and claiming perhaps at the end of his life to be Harold in Chester in the later 12th century. Given, however, that this story seems verifiably false, and even people in the Middle Ages would have been a bit suspicious about the idea that someone was 130 or 170 years old, we can ask ourselves, why did people tell this story? Well, we don't have the facility, sadly, yet, to travel back to the 12th century, to Chester, to ask the Cestrians what on earth they thought they were doing. What we have to do as historians is reconstruct the social, cultural and political context to try and see if we can find plausible reasons why people might have chosen to tell this kind of story. We can begin with George Garnett's arguments in this wonderful book, Conquered England, about the official justification of the Norman conquest, which he claims was crucially important in transforming the constitution of England, the way land was held in the 11th and 12th centuries. It was, after all, this justification of the conquest, the, the descriptions of Harold dying and being buried after the Battle of Hastings. And it's these stories, therefore, that our tale about Harold as a hermit contradicted. And as I go through, you can admire some of the images from the Bayer Tapestry, which refer to some of the events that I'm describing. Um, Edward and Harold there speaking to one another, for Harold is supposed to have visited Normandy and sworn an oath. The appearance of Haley's Comet in the sky before Harold's coronation, and his coronation at the hands of Archbishop Stigand. The Norman just survives for us in those two works by William of Jumiège and William of Poitiers, and it runs, roughly speaking, as follows. Edward the Confessor was supposed to have offered the throne to William, Duke of Normandy, and the English nobility were supposed to have sworn oaths, binding the whole English people effectively to this arrangement that the Norman Duke would succeed. This may have happened, or it may not have, in 1051 to 2. Harold was then supposedly sent, according to the Normans, in 1064 perhaps, to swear an oath to this arrangement. Nevertheless, according to the Normans, when Edward died, Harold seized the throne in violation of his oath. This is a dishonourable act. Despite this dishonour, William, who wanted to press his claim to the throne, offered before undertaking battle, that he would have his case heard according to either English or Norman law. He was a terribly reasonable man. Or indeed to engage in single combat with Harold to keep the soldiers from having to face this fate. But Harold, he's so immoral, he's so unsure of his fate that he says, no, let God decide on the battlefield. And of course, the death of Harold and the overwhelming Norman victory are a sign that God is on William's side. And all of this is confirmed by Haley's Comet. This is a sign of God's providence acting to signal that there will be a change in political regime. 
This is how it's interpreted. William reinforced all of this as King of England by writing Harold out of history, particularly out of legal history. Kingship, all of the rights of kingship derived from the reign of Edward the Confessor, and Harold was never really mentioned as a legitimate king. Well, this is all well and good, but we can see that not everybody agreed with this justification of the conquest. The life of King Edward who rests at Westminster was written probably in 1067, and it was written for Edward's widow, Edith, who was also Harold's brother. And it provided a defense of the moral probity of Edith's family, including Harold and his brothers. Iadma, a monk of Canterbury in the early 12th century, wrote this wonderful text, The History of Recent Events, and he subtly undermined the Norman justification for conquest. He suggested that Edward had not sent Harold to see William, but instead had forbidden him to go or advised him not to go. Harold had gone to secure the release of some hostages, but was unfortunately imprisoned and released and forced effectively under duress to swear an oath to things that were not really in his gift. William of Malmesbury tells a different story. He says that Harold never really intended to go, or rather he says some people say that Harold never really intended to go to Normandy. He just accidentally got blown off course on a fishing trip in the English Channel. He was skeptical of this story. The Waltham Abbey Chronicle and the Chronicle of John of Worcester acknowledge that Harold was a legitimate king and think that he was also a good king. Read in the light of this debate of a Harold, whether he was a legitimate king and whether he was a moral person, the story about Harold and Chester seems quite pointed. The idea he survived was a possible challenge to the providential outcome of the battle. The idea he became a hermit was a potential rebuttal of the argument that he was irretrievably moral. And together these ideas, as they were told, were a potential focus for resistance to the legitimacy of the kings who were descended from William. A second step towards understanding the attraction of this story is to consider the place of Chester and Cheshire in the developing English kingdom. And this is what Alan Thacker argued in that persuasive paper. Until the 10th century, lowland southern Britain was a patchwork of Old English and Old Norse speaking peoples with their own kings. It was only in the 10th century that one of these peoples and their kings the Kerdeking kings of the West Saxons in the Southwest extended their authority and created a kingdom of the English that became known as Englaland, England, and this included Chester. Allen emphasised that Chester was an important political focus in that developing English kingdom. It had a close association with Harold too, and it had a tradition of independence that was reinforced throughout the 12th century. Chester and its environs were used by English kings to assert their overlordship over Britain and the Irish Sea. Most famously, as you can see here in a stained glass window from St John's Church in 973, when King Edgar of the English came to Chester and was rowed on the Dee by the kings of six neighbouring kingdoms who acknowledged his overlordship. Chester was also a base for military operations against the Britons in what is now Wales. Harold himself undertook campaigns against Griffith ap Llewellyn, who is the King of Gwynedd in North Wales. Chester therefore was also a logical staging post for invasions and for rebellions. It was considered a key node by Edmund Ironside and Earl Uhtred of the Northumbrians in their campaign against Knut, King Knut in 1016. Under its post-conquest earls, Earls Ranulf II, Hugh II and Ranulf III, Chester became the focus of what's known as a jurisdictional immunity. What this means is that it was outside of royal administration. Our own former head of department, who's depicted on the top right there, Graham White, has written about this and the development of this in rulership and rebellion in the Anglo-Norman world. And it resulted in the 13th century in the Earls of Chester issuing their own Magna Carta 
alongside King John's Magna Carta, the great charter of promises that the king made. As Alan Thacker suggests, this imposter's story was therefore perhaps attractive as an expression of the strategic importance and the jealously guarded political independence of Chester. It's a pointed way perhaps of reminding the Norman and Angevin kings to recognise Chester's significance. Finally then, what does this reveal to us about the purposes and practices of history? Well, we can think about history, can't we, as the reconstruction of what happened and um, an attempt to find out the truth. And we've done a bit of that today in trying to look at the sources nearest to events, trying to use logical reasoning to decide whether Harold really reached the age of 130. Equally, we've done that by thinking about whether there is evidence that indeed there was a chapel of St. James and hermits and a priest called Andrew at St. John's. But it's also the province of history to think about the relationship between social organisation, cultural organisation and political ideas. And we've been doing that in thinking about the circumstances that generated this story and made it attractive. Most significantly of all, though, the study of history can sometimes teach us that it's not always what happened, but how it was remembered and who controlled the memory that mattered. Whether Harold was thought to have died at Hastings, demonstrating God's providential judgment of his immorality, or whether he survived to haunt the kings who claimed legitimacy on the basis of this fact and provide maybe a bit of leverage for those who claim some independence from their rule. That's where I'll stop talking. Thank you very much. That's great, Tom. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I've got to say I'm a little bit disappointed that it is very unlikely to be a true story. <laughs> I'm looking for a different outcome, but really interesting points that you make about you know why <laughs> why things are remembered as they are. Um, so I'll wait to see if we get any questions through from from the people who are watching at home um, as we're waiting for people to send those through. I've got a couple of questions that I sort of jotted down while you were talking. So <laughs> you talked about how if it were a true story, Harold would have moved from Winchester to Saxony, back to Dover, maybe into Wales. <laughs> Is that likely at that time that people would have actually have moved around that much? Uh, yes, this is a very good question and sometimes maybe seems a bit implausible to us. Um, but yes, absolutely, there's a, a huge amount of movement. Um, we know, for example, from the seventh century onwards that we've got accounts of pilgrims traveling from northern Britain to Rome and to Jerusalem, backwards and forwards. We've got um, abbots and bishops traveling to Rome to collect relics and paintings, sometimes to collect their um, robes, the pallium that they get from the Pope in the case of the bishops. Um, we also know that by the period we're looking at, we've got a lot of movement of families, particularly um, migration, if you like, from Central Europe or Northern Europe to um, various areas which we would consider um, peripheral. So we've got our Normans who are moving into Britain, but they're also moving into Italy and Southern Italy, uh, Southern Italy, sorry, and Sicily. We've also got them participating in the armed pilgrimages we know as the Crusades. So yes, there's a, a huge amount of movement that's that's going on. Harold's brother Tosti is supposed to have travelled on pilgrimage to Rome himself, along with um, uh, other members of Edward the Confessor's uh, household. I Iadred, who is Archbishop of York, went to collect his pallium in Rome, for example. So there's quite a lot of that sort of travel going on. Oh, that's that's really interesting. That's not what that's not what the answer that I was I was expecting. Um, and we talked a lot about um, about how King Harold you know, possibly became a hermit and that he was succeeded by other hermits. So were hermits quite significant at that time? Were they significant members of society? Um, yeah, the simple answer is yes. Yes, they were. Um, so we know with the development of monasticism in the third and fourth centuries that we get individuals who seek to live apart from society, but they're thought to get a closer relationship with God and this often attracts people to them. And this is partly where monasticism itself comes from. We get a real renewal of the eremitical life, wanting to live in isolation by yourself in the 10th and 11th centuries. So Rietta Lies has written about this and Tom Lyons, who's at Cambridge, has, has recently written about it too in a British context. Um, 
those those people um, exist alongside organized religious communities of clerics and monks and sometimes clerics and monks from those religious communities spend part of their lives living as hermits as well. What we know is that people sought them out for counsel and advice. So it's quite likely that the hermits who are living in Chester also have an active part in the, the life in Chester of the city and its citizens, that they're being consulted um, to give their wisdom from this austere lifestyle that they're living. Thank you. Um, so we've had one question in from the audience and they ask, um, does the story of Harold and Chester live on into later centuries and continue to have any local political meaning? Someone's just tapped my ignorance there and that's a really good question. I'll have to go off and have a think about that. Um, all I can say off the top of my head is that obviously it continues through to the present day. And if you go and read the work of someone like Adam Fox, who writes about the early modern period, sometimes people think that there's a distinction between oral culture and literate culture. But actually what he wrote about in, in a book on this, Orality and Literacy, is that there's a constant dialogue between the stories that people are telling orally between themselves and the literate texts that are being produced. And we're seeing this here, we're seeing a number of texts picking up on the story directly from the people of Chester and sometimes then from other texts and then sometimes these things are feeding back into each other. And that's probably true of these um, other people who are picking up on this, the uh, cleric at Laun or the author of the saga in Iceland, that these stories are travelling around partly by word of mouth and partly in text. So the simple answer is I'm almost certain, yes, it, it will be picked up in later centuries. Um, what people think about it, I don't know. I'd have to go and have a look. And I'm cursing the fact that my colleague uh, Peter Gaunt isn't here because he might well know for the early modern period um, whether this is picked up in those early modern and antiquarian texts and what people say about it. That point. Right, thanks. Um, um, there are any other questions coming through at the moment, so maybe, maybe we could wind things up for today, but there's a little bit of extra reading to be done there, isn't there? So, <laughs> maybe a follow up session in the future. Yeah. Um, so um so yeah that's 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 all for today so if we wind up there just if i can say a big thank you to you tom for your time today for that really interesting talk that really was um it really was like I said, i'm disappointed it's not a true story but <laughs> but it was really really interesting so um just to just to sort of finish things off today um so i popped a link in the chat there as you can see um so you know if you follow that link you can catch up on our past kitchen sessions which include a number of lectures from some of tom's colleagues in the history department and we've also got some sessions coming up um in the next few weeks including one from our modern languages department which is on the french resistance which might be of interest to to some people if you're interested in history um, and again you can book on there by by following that link so all that remains for me to say today is thank you to Tom again for a really interesting talk. Thanks to you for joining us um, and I wish you a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye.